Hi, I'm Mr. White Keys, and welcome back to the Music and the Mind lecture. This is a nine-part series, an investigation into the sound of music and how it moves us. This is the second video in the series. In this video, we continue our journey of discovery, looking for answers and clues as to how music impacts our emotions so directly and deeply and why. We'll talk about overtones today. So let's go down the rabbit hole and see how deep it goes. I wonder what we'll find this time. Let's try to put together the pieces of this puzzle, this huge and fantastic puzzle that is a marriage of music, engineering, physics, and mathematics. So this is sort of a map of where we are. The critical chain, music to the mind. There are nine links in this chain. We've already covered link one, musical tones. So in this video, we will talk about link two, overtones, where we explore the harmonic series in detail. After that, we'll look at link three, musical notes, how the harmonic series in nature forms the foundation of everything we understand and feel about music. After that, we will look at link four, sound waves, which describe longitudinal sound pressure waves. Following that, we will discuss link five, mechanical waves, which describes the transduction of longitudinal sound pressure waves to sinusoidal mechanical movements in the middle ear. Then we will explore link six, tonotopicity, deconstruction of complex sound waves into an array of its component frequencies by spreading them out for analysis over time and space in the 33 millimeters of the basilar membrane within the cochlea. Then we will look at link seven, electrical waves, the transduction of sinusoidal mechanical movements into electrical current. Next is link eight, place and temporal coding of frequencies, the transduction of electrical current into place and temporal coding of frequency specific neurotransmitters. And finally, we'll end our journey at link nine, the brain, interpretation by the brain of audio signals from cranial nerve eight, including psychoacoustics. So stay tuned for the next video in the series, and remember to like and subscribe. So now let's talk about link two overtones in the harmonic series in nature and how it relates to music. This is a foundational concept, so we will explore the harmonic series in considerable depth to learn what it is, and what it has to do with the universe, people, music, and how music affects the mind. This acoustical phenomenon called the harmonic series or overtone series is not hard to understand if you remember the basic high school fact that all sounds are produced by vibrating bodies which send out waves. Now, if such a vibrating body is irregularly constituted like this floor or this piano, it will emit waves which are irregular and our ears will perceive them as noise. Ow. <laughs> but if the source of vibration is of a consistent structure, like any one of the strings in this piano, it will emit regular waves and we hear them as a musical tone. Now when you pluck a guitar string or hit a piano key, you are creating a vibration of a string that is bounded at two ends. Such a string can only vibrate at multiples of the fundamental frequency determined by its length and mass. Any other frequency that tries to form a sine wave will fail because a complete wave will not fit within the two fixed ends. As a wave travels outward from the strike point in both directions toward the fixed ends, both waves get inverted and travel back and get summed into the original wave again to form a more complex wave. This happens at the same time the string itself is rebounding from being stretched. All of these motions get summed together to form a very complex motion that at once resembles a sine wave and also a wave sloshing back and forth in a bathtub that's being rocked longitudinally. The resulting motion is the sum of all frequencies starting with the fundamental tone heard as the note that we hit and adding to it frequencies that are multiples of the fundamental tone. So the fundamental tone times one, then times two, then times three, 
and so on ad infinitum. So the string will vibrate as a whole, but at the same time, it will vibrate as a half, a third, a quarter, a fifth, a sixth, a seventh, an eighth, and so on, up to and on to infinity. We call this a divergent series. And we're hearing all of these frequencies at the same time. However, we hear the fundamental tone primarily, but the multiples of the fundamental tones increasingly faintly. This resulting series of frequencies or notes that we hear when we play a single note is what we refer to as the harmonic series. The harmonic series is comprised of the fundamental tone followed by a series of overtones. You get the same result, but for slightly different reasons, with a column of air from a reed instrument, a wind instrument, a pipe organ. Or from a piece of steel, again, that has a fixed dimensions, such as a bell. Now the note determined by the length of the string is called the fundamental frequency or the fundamental tone and that is the note that you hear. This is also referred to as the first harmonic. The next frequency above the fundamental frequency in the harmonic series is called the second harmonic. It's also called the first overtone. Note that the harmonic series includes the fundamental frequency while overtones do not. These higher frequencies that are multiples of the fundamental frequency continue softer and softer, more and more faintly, up the series until you can no longer hear them. Our perception of overtones tend to disappear at the eighth or ninth harmonic for most people. Of course, overtones beyond the ninth harmonic are certainly present. In fact, there are an infinite number of them. Now let's settle for a piano string. Let's say this one, which is of a particular length tension, thickness, and density, and when struck by its hammer, produces sound waves at a frequency of 132 vibrations per second and is known to the world as the note C. Now comes the interesting part. If I sit at the piano and play that low C, you may think you're hearing only that one tone, a dark, rich bass note. But you're not. You are simultaneously hearing a whole series of higher tones that are sounding at the same time. And these are arranged in an order preordained by nature and ruled by universal physical laws. If this is news to you, I hope it's good news. Because all these upper notes, of which you may be unaware, result from a phenomenon of nature whereby any sound producing source or I should say pitch producing source, such as this piano string, vibrates not only as the whole string in all its whatever inch glory, sounding that low C, but also in fractional segments of that string, each vibrating separately. It's as though the string were infinitely divisible into two halves, into three thirds, four quarters, and so on. And the smaller those segments are, the faster they vibrate, producing higher and higher frequencies and therefore higher and higher tones, overtones, or harmonics as they're sometimes called. Now these overtones or harmonics are all sounding together with the fundamental sound of the full string. Now remember I spoke of a preordained order in which the overtones appear. Let's see if I can make you actually hear those overtones in that order. The first overtone of the series, according to the laws of physics, has to be exactly an octave higher than the fundamental C we've been hearing. In other words, it's going to be this C, an octave higher. Now, if I silently press down the key of this higher C 
and hold it so that the string is free to vibrate, and then abruptly strike the fundamental C, an octave lower, what do you hear? You are clearly hearing the first overtone vibrating sympathetically an octave above its fundamental. I hope you heard it, did you? Listen again. Clear as a bell. So obviously this upper C is an integral part of the C an octave below. It's a built-in harmonic sounded by the two halves of that lower string vibrating independently. Uh, the next overtone of this preordained C, uh, order results from that same fundamental string vibrating in three parts. And this one will be the first different overtone. That is the first one you'll hear other than a C. And it's going to be a G, this G. And now let's repeat our experiment. I press this new one down silently, and then again strike the fundamental C. What do we hear now? That G, right? A new tone, again clear as a bell. You want to hear it again? What's important to understand is that overtones do not determine pitch for us. Only the fundamental frequency determines our perception of pitch. We are not really conscious of the overtones because they are upstaged by the relative loudness of the fundamental tone. The overtones are usually only faint sounds in the background in comparison to the fundamental tone. In other words, the overtones serve to support and complement the fundamental tone. In fact, if you played the sounds of all the overtones for a particular fundamental tone, but then you omit that tone entirely, your mind will actually re-add the fundamental tone and loudly. In fact, it'll be the only sound you hear, even though that tone is entirely in your imagination. This is how bookshelf speakers are able to play low bass notes that it's actually physically incapable of reproducing by simply reproducing the corresponding overtones that would have been associated with the low bass note. So these speakers can now produce sounds that are an octave below whatever its physical limit might have been. Thus, they create the illusion of having a wider dynamic range than they actually have. We'll talk more about this and other related phenomena when we discuss psychoacoustics in Link 9, The Brain. So, is it possible that we are all born with a shared understanding of musical grammar that is rooted in the universal phenomenon of the harmonic series. A universal understanding that is the foundation of music and culture around the world. Is there a case for monogenesis, as we have uh, with linguistics? Let's continue our journey down the rabbit hole and see how deep it goes. Now, there have been a few studies that reveal that children around the world, regardless of what continent they're on, what language they speak, what country they live in, or what culture they come from, tease each other and call each other using the same pattern of two notes with a three note variant that is even more interesting for reasons we'll discuss shortly. For instance, children call out to each other with these two notes. Jeannie, Angie. Sometimes adults do the same thing. Na, 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 na. Two very special notes, which children also use to call one another. Jerry, Doris, whatever. And when children play games or tease each other, a three note variant of this pattern emerges. Na, 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 na. They always put a little dirt on that penultimate syllable, that third emergent note in the three note variant. Ali, Ali, and come free. So, the question is why just these three notes in particular? Why in this? particular order. 
And thus, I submit to you that we have found another substantive universal along our journey. Because the answer is rooted in physics and mathematics, and specifically, the harmonic series. Each of us is born with a sensitivity to the harmonic series based on the fact that the basilar membrane in our inner ear senses things logarithmically, which is why we hear things in terms of ratios. The hairs of the inner ear cover eight octaves of frequencies in rows about 2.5 centimeters long, which constitute the range of our hearing. So every three millimeters is another octave in the inner ear. So when waves travel through the cochlea, they create small waves in the basilar membrane itself. And as these smaller waves in the basilar membrane progress down the membrane itself, they reach their peak at the part of the membrane that responds to the frequency of the sound wave created by the original stimulus. Thus, our ear was designed very precisely to sense pitches as well as the overtones comprising the harmonic series. Now let's go back to the example of the harmonic series and listen again. But this time, we're listening for the third, fourth, and fifth overtones in the series. So, assuming we are in the key of C, we get G, then E, followed by a curious note that distinguishes the three-note variant. That note actually doesn't exist on the piano, but it does in the harmonic series. Instead, it exists about halfway between this A and the B-flat above it, right in between those two notes. We hear this as dissonant because the ratio of the two frequencies is quite irregular and complex. If I play those two notes together, you almost immediately hear it as reminiscent of a children's song or something childish in nature. See how we kind of come full circle here. So what these children are doing is simply singing using the third, fourth, and fifth overtones of a particular key. That's why they put a little dirt on that third note, nah, 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 because it's in between the two notes of our 12-note diatonic scale. And they do this without having been taught about the diatonic scale or the harmonic series or any musical training at all. It's just something they're born with. So the notes of the harmonic series are established by nature and govern how all things vibrate. These overtones are less obvious to us than the fundamental tone, but we sense them nonetheless. Now let's talk about timbre. Timbre is that distinguishing characteristic that differentiates one sound from another, despite the fact that it might be playing the same frequency at the same amplitude or volume. So let's call it maybe the flavor of the sound, if you will. There are two dimensions to timbre. One of them is spectral, which has to do with a fingerprint that each sound has based on the relative amplitude or emphasis of each of the overtones in its particular harmonic series. Then there is the second part, which is temporal, which is the shape of the attack, sustain, decay, and release of the sound. For instance, a piano string is struck by a hammer and thus has a sharper attack than a cello, which is put into motion by the gentle stroke of a bow. Timbre allows us to distinguish between a piano, a cello, a guitar, and a flute, for example.
A violin, for instance, emphasizes the second, fourth, and eighth harmonic, while a flute emphasizes the second and third harmonic. That's that sort of fingerprint that forms the relative um, emphasis we have on certain harmonics over others. And of course, we're also listening to this over time. So these two instruments have very different envelopes, a different attack, sustain, delay, and release. And that also helps us to finalize our distinction via temporal analysis. Now, when it comes to any instrument, no two pieces of wood are the same. They respond to and amplify different aspects of each of the harmonics, which we'll call formants. This is what makes a Steinway piano sound different from a Fazioli or a Beckstein. Now, in that case, the type of wood is different that's used in these piano. But within the Steinway line, the type of woods that are used are consistent. Same thing with a Fazioli or a Carl Beckstein. However, there are also different pieces of wood that are being put together. So even though they might all be from the same tree for the same part in a Steinway, it's still a different tree. That's why pianists can sit in front of a handmade Steinway piano and play 15 or 20 of them before they choose a piano that speaks to them because they're actually listening for those slight variations in formats that have to do with the wood that was used to put the piano together, that particular piano. In fact, plucking a guitar in different places produces different sounds because of these formats as well, as they emphasize the harmonics in different ways. So if I play a guitar closer to the bridge, I get one sound. If I play it closer to the fretboard, I get another sound. If I play it with my fingernail, or if I play it with the, the skin of, of the end of my finger, I'm also gonna get different sounds. And the reason I'm getting different sounds is because different harmonics are appearing as the string vibrates. By plucking it in different places, the additional modes of vibration, the harmonics, may be strengthened or weakened. Finally, timbre enables us to distinguish different vowels and consonants in human speech, and even marks the difference between one person's voice and another's, allowing us to identify whose voice we're hearing. In fact, timbre plays a critical role in auditory identification. Different materials, different vowels, different consonants, voices, and instruments. And as we're performing this analysis in the auditory cortex of the brain, there's a complex constellation of brain areas that work together in both the right and left lobes to analyze timbre. And we'll talk more about this when we get to link nine, the brain. Now, when a string is bounded on both sides, for example, it vibrates. It's vibrating as a whole, and then in the infinite series of divergent fractional vibrations that produce overtones. We call these partials. A node is that part of the string that does not move for a particular harmonic, but rather forms the fulcrum for the vibration of the string. It's said to have zero length. So it's not factored into the remaining length you will see why this is important when we begin to discuss inharmonicity a bit later. For the first harmonic, which is a fundamental frequency, technically you could say that there are two nodes, one at each end of the string where it's bounded. But we don't typically talk about nodes in that fashion. We talk about nodes when we get to the second harmonic, where the string is vibrating in halves. So there's one node right in the dead center of the string that doesn't vibrate and it forms a fulcrum for the vibration on either side of it. And, of course, for the third harmonic, there are two nodes that allow the string to vibrate in thirds, and this continues. The antinode is that part of the string that moves the farthest. So, for the first harmonic, which is the fundamental frequency, there's one antinode, and that's in the dead center of the string. For the second harmonic, there are two antinodes. And for the third harmonic, there are three antinodes, and so on. <clears throat> if we pluck or strike the string at the exact location of one of these nodes, 
we introduce a pattern of destructive interference in the vibration of the string that effectively cancels out the sound of the corresponding overtone. The seventh harmonic is a minor seventh that is a bit flat in relationship to our diatonic 12 note scale. And therefore it sounds like crap to us, right? Well, we designed pianos so that the hammers always strike the piano strings exactly six sevenths from the very back of the string. So you'll see six sevenths of the length of the string behind where the hammer strike, and from where the hammer strike to the bridge that's nearest you is one seventh. Can you imagine what happens when we do this? This makes the resulting note sound more pleasant to us because what it's doing is it's canceling that seventh overtone. That's why on the Clavin's upright piano, which is the tallest piano in the world, you have to climb stairs, two flights of stairs, just to get to the keyboard. You might be asking yourself, well, why can't they just put the hammers on the bottom? This is why. We have to cancel that seventh overtone. Now, consequently, the 11th harmonic is also a problematic for similar reasons. But because the sound of it is so faint, we don't worry about it. The human ear can hear maybe the first seven or eight, and after that, it's very hard to hear the remaining harmonics. Now, because the materials we use for our instruments are imperfect, such as the strings on a guitar, cello, or piano, we have the concept of inharmonicity. Using the piano as an example, piano strings are made out of a stiff metal, steel, right? Which doesn't quite bend perfectly. And there may be overtones which are not whole number multiples of the fundamental. Why? Well, in theory, a node point has no length, and we've said that. But because the steel from a piano string is made in such a way that it has some rigidity, the node point also has some dimension. Now here's why that's a problem. The result is that the node points shorten the remaining string length, so the partials then start becoming sharper and sharper in relation to the ideal harmonic pitch. So with each higher harmonic, the number of nodes increases, and the degree to which the remaining string is shortened becomes more and more exaggerated, resulting in a sharper and sharper pitch. That's why guitar makers, for instance, take this into account when designing steel guitars and deliberately lengthen the distance between frets in comparison with the design of the fretboard that you would make for a guitar with nylon strings. Piano tuners similarly take this into account when tuning a piano. So when we tune a piano, and we tune A2, which is like the third, because the first one is A0, then A1, then A2. We tune A2 to 110 hertz, then we tune A3 to 220 hertz. We end up with a problem. So instead of A2's first overtone being 220 hertz, which is what we would expect, and A3's first overtone being 440 hertz, A2's first overtone will actually be 222 hertz. It's moving sharper because there is dimension to the node, because the steel won't bend the way it would in our theoretical model, right? And then A3's first overtone will actually be 444 hertz. This gap will continue to increase as you go up the piano, so the problem gets worse and worse. So what do we do? How do we rectify this? How do we make something that simply can't fit together, fit together in a way that will sound in tune to us. Well, to rectify this, we tune A2 on a piano to 109 hertz so that the first overtone is 121 hertz. And then A3 to 221 hertz so that its first overtone is 445 hertz. And then continue to stretch in a similar fashion as we go up the piano. Now, as a result of doing this, the 16th overtone will be a semitone higher than it should be, and when we get to the 50th overtone, it's actually a perfect fifth higher than it should be. But this tuning technique is what we commonly use to tune the piano, and it's called octave stretching. The reason this works and makes the piano sound in tune to us derives from a combination of physical phenomena as well as mental phenomena described in psychoacoustics as pitch perception. 
First of all, the way the inner ear is designed, we're able to detect pitch less accurately in the extremely low frequencies, as well as in the extremely high frequencies. So our mind tends to pull low frequencies up and high frequencies down. This may have evolved based on a survival skill of perceiving human speech. Correspondingly, our perception of pitch is heavily biased toward the range of human speech, which is somewhere around two kilohertz to five kilohertz. And our mind pulls higher frequencies down and lower frequencies up when we perceive them. As such, if we were to tune the upper notes more accurately, they'd actually sound discordant to us. In the next video, we're going to put everything that we've learned thus far. We've talked about a lot of stuff and we've laid the foundation of what we're gonna talk about in understanding the harmonic series. We'll begin to answer the question, how does the harmonic series in nature form the cornerstone of everything we understand and feel about music? Thanks for watching the video and remember to like and subscribe and I'll see you in the next video.